Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to let this roll for a minute or two to ensure that sound quality and, and video quality is there before I get to getting on this presentation. So let me know where you all are from, where you're watching in from, what your weather's like, where you're at, and then we'll get this presentation going. So I'll just introduce myself real fast and uh, kind of wait till everyone gathers in for the live and then I'll get going. My name is Chelsea Burnett and I am one of several members of Texas Storm Chasers. You may or may not uh, know me as the public speaker of the group. I am the one that goes around statewide giving presentations in person and I also give presentations globally, virtually. So I am launching one of 12 monthly adult presentations on severe weather awareness and storm chasing. This is a common topic that I provide for my adult talks. And when I say adult talks, I mean, you know, for the adult audience. So um, groups like Capital One, I have spoken virtually with our Plano branch office for Capital One before on severe weather awareness. I have spoken to many rotary clubs. I have spoken to libraries all on the adult front. So Audrey, thank you for that confirmation on me being able to, or you being able to hear me. Good morning, Violet. Thank you for joining. Awesome. So we got 60 people in here. So I think this is a, a good cue to go ahead and get on into this. So I'm going to take the next 30 minutes just to roughly speak about severe weather awareness, talk about the four topics of severe weather that we tend to experience here most often in North Texas. So uh, without further ado, we'll get going here. So again, my name is Chelsea Burnett. Um, I joined the group back in 2016 officially, but I met owner of Texas Storm Chasers, David Reimer, our Baldy in Chief, uh, back in 2010 or 2011. He'll have to correct me on that. Um, but uh, I have been part of the group for several years and just started doing the public speaking thing in 2018. So Jason Cooley, our in-house meteorologist, he kicked off the presentation front and then I took over the reins in 2018. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about me at first. You know, a lot of people are very curious just to how we got involved with storm chasing. So um, before I really get going in the presentation, I do want to make sure that we don't have any hiccups like we did last night with the um, internet. Um, our internet speeds were awful last night for our official start at 7 p.m. for the adult presentation. So for everyone who stuck around, I really appreciate you. Uh, for those who weren't able to stick around just because it was that awful, I completely apologize. But I did some testing this morning and it does appear that all systems are go and everything seems to be pretty stable. <laughs> so um, we check the comments here, make sure there's no issues. Violet's watching from Denton. Awesome. I'm just across the toll bridge from you uh, over on the other side of Lake Louisville from you. So good of you to be here. All right. So a little bit about me. Um, I was born and raised in Oklahoma. So boomer sooner. But before you come for me, before you bring out those pitchforks, I have been living here in Texas for the last 15 years, officially in July. So I have been living in the North Texas area for 15 years. I've grown to love it. This is a great place to be. Um, as you can see here, I am also a mother. I have an almost nine-year-old son. Um, he is my pride and joy, and I'm also a spouse. I have a Storm Chaser partner, and he is co-owner of Illinois Storm Chasers, and is also known as Storm Chaser Adam Lucio on social media. So we, you know, this is a family of, of Storm Chasers here. So growing up in Oklahoma, I was never a stranger to storms. In fact, I was having this conversation with, with my mother last summer. She said, you know, when you were two, three years old, you would just watch the storms. You were never afraid of the storms. So it was uh, funny to hear that and um, know that I was already obsessed at that toddler age. So, <laughs> um, you know, I would get older and I would actually just watch the storms out the window. I would, I would run the door, run the window, even at night. If I heard storms in the middle of the night, I would get up, bolt out of bed, watch the storms out the window. 
bottom line, I was never afraid, you know, and, and a lot of storm chasers, their background comes from the fear of storms when they were kids and they overcame that fear with storm chasing. That was never the case for me. I was, I was born a storm chaser, if, if, if you will. So, um, in school, I would tell my teachers, you know, how much I liked weather and they were very helpful in telling me how much math and science I would need in the field of meteorology. So when I got older and I went, uh, on to college, um, I did attempt to attend the School of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, unfortunately, I could not get past the math. Um, there was calculus one, two, three, four, linear statistics, you know, all sorts of math classes that you need. And not only did I fail Calc 1 once, twice, I failed it three times. I just had to really be sure <laughs> that I wasn't gonna get this. And so uh, that's when I kind of shifted gears. I moved here to North Texas and I actually ended up getting a degree in business from the University of North Texas. So go mean green for anyone that's watching and you're in UNT alumni. Um, so having the degree in business was actually a little bit more helpful for me personally, um, going through my adult season of life and i've been able to apply it to being a part of texas storm chasers and giving these presentations like i am today so i'm a visual learner too so a lot of the storm chasing i have done since 2011 i've actually learned a lot more being out in the elements versus being inside a classroom reading out of a textbook so if you're like me you're a visual learner you'll totally understand that i completely envy the people who can just read a textbook and it clicks i envy you so much so um, while here in Texas, you know, I met David Reimer in 2010 or 2011, and then I met Jenny Brown, and we all became friends. We all started to hang out at, at the local Joe's Pizza in Little Elm. Comment if you know what I mean there, if you know the owner, um, Gilly, he's awesome. So in that time, I did a couple things to help me get a leg up with storm chasing. I tested and obtained my... A license for ham radio operation. Yes, I am a ham radio operator. That is my call sign there on the screen, Kilo Foxtrot 5, Hotel Alpha Sierra. And I also attended what's called a Skywarn Storm Spotter training course in Collin County. And that was very instrumental. That is an all day class. It's divided into a morning and afternoon portion with the morning portion being on basic um, weather concepts. And then the afternoon portion was the more advanced stuff. I stayed through the whole thing. I obtained my certificate and, uh, went on my merry way, you know, started storm chasing, but I didn't see my first tornado until December of 2015. So started storm chasing with David and Jenny in 2011. Didn't see that first tornado until 2015. And I'm sure you're wondering, well, how many tornadoes have you seen since then? Well, I've actually seen 32 tornadoes and counting since uh, June of last year. So I'm already feeling that itch. I'm ready for a good storm to chase at this point. Um, but since June, I did chase my first hurricane in August. It was Hurricane Ida in Louisiana. And that was an incredible, eye-opening, humbling experience. Would I seek out to chase another hurricane? Perhaps if it's in Texas or Louisiana, I don't think I'd venture out that, that much farther just for the sake of, of time. And of course, being a, a family person, you know, I have a kid <laughs> I have to take care of. So uh, that's just a little bit about me, kind of how I grew up, how I got involved with storm chasing. But let's get into the meat of the presentation. We're going to talk about um, lightning, tornadoes, hail and flooding, because that's simply the four most common types of severe weather that we see here in North Texas. Um, and also to keep this presentation at kind of a, a, a short time limit here. So just real quick, a lot of this information that I'll be talking about, you can find from two sources, the National Weather Service Office that's local to your county, uh, to your area, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So you can find most of everything I'm talking about on those two websites. So. The first topic is lightning. And yes, that is my own lightning photo there you see. That was taken in Calvesta, Kansas a few years ago. That is my most prolific lightning shot. Completely unexpected, completely scared us. You can tell by how off-center <laughs> the lightning strike was because we did not expect something that spectacular in that moment. So that did send us back to the car for the rest of the evening. And we were pretty convinced that that was gonna be our last chase ever because it was just the best thing that happened. So 
Um, with lightning, I, you know, this is a lot of information you guys have already heard of before, but we have a lot of new people moving into Texas and they're just not quite in tune with how crazy our weather can get and just how dangerous it can be. So when we talk about lightning, a lot of the injuries and fatalities that happen from lightning strikes are from people who waited too long to seek shelter. You know, a lot of us get in this mindset that, oh, that'll never happen to me, right? I'm guilty of that mindset sometimes. You know, it's like, oh, I hear that about other people, but that doesn't happen to me. Um, it can. And this next fact, I am speaking from facts. I am not trying to talk down on any particular gender or age range, but this is simply facts. Over 80% of the lightning injuries and fatalities that happen are from you guys, are from you males are from dudes who are out there, you know, golfing, swimming, out on the lake, barbecuing, tailgating, you know, whatever it may be that brings you outdoors. And then they're typically between the ages of 15 and 40. Me being 35, I kind of laugh at this because I'm like, yeah, I, I can totally see that. So if you're above 40, you're probably good, right? Right? I hope so. <laughs> so, and of course, you know, most of those activities you know, bring you out in the summer afternoons and evenings, which is typically when uh, those injuries and fatalities happen the most often, you know, because you're outside and also that's just prime time for storms to happen. So not only do we worry about ourselves being out outside, you know, whenever it's storming, we also have to worry about other um, risks when it comes to lightning. You know, they can cause structure fires. If, if we're in a really rough drought year and, you know, there's a storm that's coming in the summer, that's bad news for, you know, mainly west Texas. I know a lot of y'all have experienced, you know, wildfires out there. And then also structure fires. Um, at least once a year, I hear of a local neighborhood here in the DFW area that, you know, a few homes have suffered lightning strikes, and then they either have partial or they fully burn uh, because of those lightning strikes. So that's, that's pretty scary stuff. All right, there are a few myths when it comes to knowing things about lightning, and I'm gonna share with you the three kind of most common or most important ones to share. So the first one is, you know, if it's not raining, then there's no danger of lightning. That is absolutely false. Just because it's not raining where you're at doesn't mean you're not at risk. And that is because of a simple phrase you've probably heard of before. It is, when thunder roars go indoors, right? So this means that as soon as you hear thunder, you are already too close to the storm and you're at risk for getting struck. So it's important that you understand that lightning can strike outside of a thunderstorm up to 10 miles away on average. If you think of how far 10 miles away is, yeah, you're definitely not going to be in that rain part of the thunderstorm. You're going to be way outside of that. So that's why it doesn't make sense. And then um, in rare occasions, lightning can strike outside of a thunderstorm up to 25 miles away. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So the second myth is that rubber soles, shoes, tires, whatever, will absolutely protect us from being struck. That is also false. And I, in, in the five years, four years I've been giving these presentations, I actually talked to a lightning strike victim on Tuesday at one of my presentations in Mansfield. <laughs> so it was a, a coach at a local school and he was sharing his story with me before I got to talking with the kids. And um, in the instance that rubber might be helpful is highlighted in, in, in this story. Um, he was in his vehicle, lightning struck the vehicle. He said it was kind of a flash bang thing. He was dazed for a couple minutes. The lights were flashing on his dashboard. He couldn't get his car started. But what likely happened and what typically happens with lightning strikes like this is that the charge from the lightning strike travels through the frame of the vehicle, out through the tires and out onto the street, keeping him safe inside. And I, he was living and breathing, talking with me, no problems at all. He survived this lightning strike to his car um, because of, of this process. So um, that was a really neat thing to say especially when I got to the lightning topic for the kids. And I said, hey, coach back there's been struck. And they're like, what? So that was a pretty cool story for him to share with me. But um, the third and probably the most important myth, in my opinion, um, is this. 
Now I'm talking to you people who are first aid and CPR certified. So if you're certified, let me know if you're certified and through who, so that people in the comments who want to get certified in first aid CPR can, and you guys will be helpful in your recommendations for that. So the third myth is that when people are struck by lightning, they should absolutely not be touched because they could carry an electric charge. So let's take, for instance, I get struck by lightning because I'm taking photos of the lightning bolts outside my car. Someone is okay to help me out. They, they can touch me. They can, they, they can check for my vitals and stuff without the risk of getting struck because as soon as I'm struck, that electric charge disperses and it's gone, okay? But what happens to me after the fact is that I go into what's called cardiac arrest, you know, which is a fancy way of saying my heart stops beating. So if someone in my chase vehicle or someone nearby knows first aid CPR, they can very well save my life because it only takes a few minutes of my heart not beating to start causing severe brain damage and potentially death. So if my chase partner knows CPR, they could start doing those breaths and compressions on me while someone else dials 911 and waits for EMS to arrive on the scene. So this is super important if, if you're in, in the school system or you're a coach or you're just um, a member of society that's, that's outdoors a lot at, at games and such. Um, if, if you're first aid CPR certified, you could very well help save someone's life. So good stuff about lightning. All right, remember how I talked about how on average lightning strikes outside of a thunderstorm up to 10 miles away? Well, on the left is a radar screen grab from an app called Radar Scope. It is of a nice, healthy supercell thunderstorm, you know, west of the Midland Odessa area. That blue line that's going diagonal across the bottom part of that screen, that's I-20. So that's I-20 heading uh, southwest out of Midland Odessa area. And we have this nice, healthy supercell near town of Wink. If you take the center part of that storm and stretch all the way out to that, to that lightning bolt, that white lightning bolt you see on the screen, that is 25 miles away. Now that's pretty rare, but here we are with a real life example that it can happen. So, you know, let's take the worst case scenario. What if you are stuck outside <laughs> in the middle of a storm and you have absolutely nowhere to go? Now, I'm going to say all this, you know, assuming that you all know that trees are not safe. We do not hide under trees whatsoever because they are the tallest objects in the sky and lightning is attracted to the tallest objects in the sky generally. So, we want to try to make ourselves as small as possible. Now on Zoom, or if I'm in person, I usually ask for some volunteers to help demonstrate this. So if you want to practice this at home or in your office, get some laughs out of some people, by all means, have at it. But what you want to do is you want to crouch down like a catcher in baseball. We all know what a catcher looks like. They squat down, they wait for the ball. You want to get down into a squat position, but we're gonna make it a little bit more complicated, okay? We are going to need to be up on our tiptoes in that squat. And not only do we need to be up on our tiptoes, we also need to have our heels together. We're not in Kansas anymore. So heels together, up on our tiptoes, and we want, to, we want to make ourselves as small as possible, but we are also trying to make as little contact with their ground as possible. And this is in the event that a lightning strike does happen nearby and that electric charge surges through the ground, your heels together is going to minimize that impact because what's said is that the lightning strike will just go through one foot and out the other and that's it. It won't travel throughout your entire body if you're in this position. Um, and I'll also note that that golf club there, I would probably send that sucker a little bit further away because that's also a conductor of electricity in itself. So that's just a little bit about lightning there. If you have questions, feel free to drop them into the comments and I'll be happy to answer them as I shuffle between these topics. Um, I appreciate everybody that's watching. Um, I hope you guys all stick around. You know, I try to keep these things humorous and lighthearted and fun, uh, especially if um, you all have heard this information before. So, um, all right, I, ju I just checked the comments and there's not anything there. So I will go ahead and move on to tornadoes. This is always a favorite topic amongst, especially the kids. The kids go wild when I mention tornadoes. So a little bit of carbonated water there. I get to talking a lot throat gets a little scratchy so <laughs> uh tornadoes the background photo you're looking at here that is of an the one and only ef4 tornado i've witnessed and that was in chapman kansas back in may of 2016 yes we were that close to that tornado 
watched it from birth till end. It was, it was crazy. So here in Texas, storms typically move from southwest to northeast. Typically, that's why there's that big giant arrow, because that's the normal. The little small arrows indicate how storms can also move. If you're from Texas, you know this, right? Chelsea, I know this. Storms move, you know, south to north, north to south, east to west. They move in all kinds of directions. But for the sake of knowledge and for the sake of learning and to apply to later slides that I'll talk about, we're going to say storms on average move from southwest to northeast. Got that? All right, you'll need to apply that here in a second. All right, this is my <laughs> this is my sad attempt at creating a donut pie chart in Excel and representing the percentages of how often these tornadoes happen. And when I talk about these tornadoes, I talk about the intensity of these tornadoes. So if you don't already know, tornado damage is measured on a scale called the Enhanced Fujita Scale, or EF scale for short. Fujita is the name of the scientist who came up with this scale back in the 1900s. And um, it goes from a zero to a five, with zero being the weakest of tornadoes and five being the absolute most destructive of tornadoes. So for the sake of math and for the sake of theory and just understanding the, this concept, let's say that here in the United States, 100 tornadoes happened this year. We know it'll probably be more than that, but for the sake of math and understanding this, 100 tornadoes happen in the U.S. this year. Out of those 100 tornadoes, 88 of those 100 tornadoes or 88% of the tornadoes that happen in the U.S. on an average is going to be an EF0 to EF1. That's almost all the tornadoes that happen here on an annual basis. And an EF0 to EF1 have winds typically from 65 to 110 miles per hour. They're not on the ground for very long, maybe a couple minutes. So these tornadoes are weak, they're short-lived, and they don't have enough time to cause a whole lot of damage. So this should be great news for you all. Um, you know, if you're new to Texas, I hope this brings you a wave of relief because I know watching the news can cause some panic when it comes to severe weather during the spring. So rest assured that most often the tornadoes that happen are EF0s to EF1s. Now we talk about EF2s to EF3s. 11 of the 100 tornadoes or 11% of tornadoes that happen on an annual basis in the United States is going to be EF2s to EF3s. These tornadoes are on the ground for a little bit longer. 20, 30 minutes, maybe an hour. Their wind speeds are higher. Um, and then maybe one tornado out of 100 will be an EF4 to EF5. So 1% of the tornadoes that happen in the U.S. on an annual basis are going to be EF4s or 5s. That should be great news for us. EF4s, EF5s are tornadoes that are long-lived. They're on the ground for an hour plus. Um, they also have wind speeds approaching two, 300 miles per hour. So um, the fact that this only happens in 1% of the tornadoes on average is, again, that's, that's great news for us. So let me know if you're new to Texas and that actually helps you, that actually brings the anxiety level down a little bit. Let me know in the comments if, if you're new to the area and where you're at. All right, so if you're here in North Texas and you see your county here, great. This, this will help you out a lot. If you don't, don't, don't worry. Um, the concept applies the same. So again, this is a, a slightly outdated graphic, but it, it gets the point across here. So this is a snapshot of the 49 counties, I believe, that our Fort Worth National Weather Service office covers here in Texas. There are 13 different National Weather Service offices in Texas, I believe. And our Fort Worth office is just one of those. And they cover over 40 counties. <laughs> That's just mind blowing to me. That's a lot of responsibility. And what you're looking at here is the number of tornadoes in each county that have happened between 1880 and 2020. Yes, 2020. I don't, I haven't found the updated graphic through, you know, the end of last year yet. So um, you're probably bullseye looking at the middle of this at Tarrant, Dallas, and Johnson counties. And you're like, holy cow, you know, look at the number of tornadoes in those counties. What in the world? Let me give you my personal take on this and kind of help break this down a little bit. What is in those two counties in Tarrant and Dallas County? It's our entire DFW Metroplex. Okay, we have Fort Worth in Tarrant County and we have Dallas in Dallas County. And it's our biggest Metroplex here in the county warning area. So this means there are way more people and way more structures and buildings than any other place on this map. 
So if even the weakest five second little birch fart tornado were to happen, someone's gonna know about it, something's gonna get hit and it's gonna get reported, right? If that same tornado happened out in somewhere, say Mills County, it may or may not get reported because it may or may not get seen or it may or may not cause destruction. Do you see what I'm saying here? So in those, in those two counties, you know, it's going to be the most reported number of tornadoes for obvious reasons. Um, when we talked about the direction of tornadoes moving from southwest to northeast, here is where I want you to apply this. So I'm in Denton County. So if you're in North Texas, look for your county and listen up here. So I'm in Denton County. If there is a tornado watch or a severe thunderstorm watch or something that's off to my south and west, say I hear about it. What time is it? Is it almost 1030? Yeah, it's 1028. Say we hear about a watch that's in effect for Erath, Palo Pinto, Parker, Wise, or Tarrant counties. I'm going to start paying attention to that because I'm going to go, whoa, those, those storms are going to form to the southwest and they'll most likely track over Denton, Cook, Collin counties, you know, toward the afternoon and evening. That gives me a leg up like, whoo, I know what's about to happen. I should probably plan my day around this just in case, you know, storms do fire later and cause some issues. So if you're watching this, let me know what county you're in, if you know. Hopefully you do. Comment and let me know what county you're in. If you're in Denton County, I'd love to know that too. That's where I'm at. I'm checking the, count, uh, the comments to make sure there's no issues with the stream. So, all right. So again, just know the surrounding counties around you so that in the event you do hear of some weather watches going up for those counties, it'll just give you that much more of a heads up, especially if you're new to Texas. Okay, for the sake of living here in Denton County, I'm gonna use it as an example for these next couple of slides. So what you're looking at here is a snapshot of Denton County and all of its tornado tracks since 1950. Okay, and it is through 2022. Pat on the back there for at least finding that information. Um, and down at the bottom, you'll see the color code for those tracks. Black is EF0, blue is EF1, orange or green is EF2, orange is an EF3. And then the other colors are EF4 and EF5. But guess what? We don't see those in Denton County. In fact, we don't even see those in any of the counties surrounding it. So that's good news for us. That means since 1950, we have not had a violent tornado in Denton County knock on wood let's all knock on wood as i say that because i really don't want to jinx us this year and remember how i talked about that southwest and northeast movement look at those tracks those tracks mainly all have that southwest to northeast movement there so and then you can tell the weaker tornadoes aren't on the ground for as long you see a lot of dots and little scratches in those tornado paths you know, you do have a couple of EF1s that decided to prove the system wrong and stay on the ground for a little bit. <laughs> you have that EF2 that goes through Pilot Point there at the top that tracked for a long while. So let me know if you're in any of those towns that we're looking at here. Um, I think I remember that Aubrey tornado um, near the, oh no, not Crum. It's Crum that I remember from a few years ago. So let me know if you're in any of those places as we talk about it. So, okay, I see a lot of people commenting you're in Collin County. I got you. All you have to do is Google search Collin County Tornado Climatology. That's all you got to do. And usually the first couple of Google results are going to take you straight to one of these pictures. Okay, so that's your homework assignment. If you're in Collin County, look that up that way. All right, this is that same data, but it actually goes back to 1880. So yes, the first slide was from 1950 as far as the tornado tracks go, but as far as just reporting a tornado in general, this information actually goes all the way back to 1880, and we have had 62 total tornadoes in Denton County since 1880 through the middle part of this month. And remember how I talked about the percentages and how often EF0s, EF1s, 2s happen? Look at here. This is a prime visual of exactly what I mentioned earlier. We got our EF0s and EF1s for Denton County totaling at 41. That's well over half of the tornadoes that happened in Denton County since 1880. And then you notice that drastically drops off, which goes right in line with the percentages I talked about, the average percentages of these tornadoes. So it's not fake news I'm giving you here. This is a prime example here. And you notice that EF4 and EF5, there's three for Denton County. But on the previous slide, there wasn't. 
That's because that was 1950 on. This is 1880 on. So prior to 1950, we did have three violent tornadoes. So let's hope it stays in the past, right? Knock on wood again. All right. And then the final slide just breaks it out in, in months. You can tell that severe weather can happen at any time of the year. All it takes is the perfect amount of ingredients, the perfect number of, of ingredients to be there to create severe weather. It doesn't matter what time of the year for us, except for January. Right now, tornadoes are like, we're tired of it. We're taking a break. We're not happening. And then things kick off in March, April, May. Spring, if you're new to Texas, spring is our most common time for severe weather here in North Texas. March, April, May are our craziest months for severe weather. Um, now, June can, can show some late spring, early summer mischief there, and then it drops off in July and August because, shoot, it is too hot here in Texas for tornadoes to happen. And then you notice a slight uptick in the fall. That is because here in North Texas, the fall can pretty much be considered a secondary tornado season. You know, what's happening in the spring and fall? We've got our changing in the seasons, correct? Uh, we've got our early cold fronts coming in, you know, in the spring, or late cold fronts coming in in the spring. We've got our early cold fronts coming in in the fall, creating that friction in the atmosphere, bringing us severe weather. So you can tell severe weather can happen any time of the year. That's why it's important to always be prepared. All right, so we're halfway through. We're gonna talk about some hail here. Uh, this is actually a photo, if you're familiar with North Texas, uh, this is near the, this is in Allen. This is uh, right outside the town of Fairview. Um, it's like Little Elm to Frisco, uh, if you will. And that's not snow on the ground. That is hail. Jenny Brown and I went on a storm chase, ton of hail, it created hail fog on the road. It was wild times. All right, so this is a photo from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration website. This is of a mobile home that has been obliterated by what's likely wind-driven large hail, okay? So let's talk about that for a second. We're looking at, at busted windows. We are looking at busted siding, uh, busted skirting. In fact, there's even, if you look real close at the ground, there's even some pits in the ground from where that large hail fell and took out chunks of the ground. And of course, this is a mobile home, y'all. Mobile homes are not as structurally sound as our typical traditional homes or apartment complexes, okay? So this is a worst case scenario of what can happen in a severe thunderstorm with very large hail. So when we're out and about and we're driving, I know a lot of your instinct is to think about you know an overpass if you're on the road if you're out taking care of errands or you're traveling from one part of the state to another and you come up on a severe thunderstorm your first thought is probably to hide under an overpass i know that's that's been a thing since the 1990s when a family and a news crew took shelter in one i believe in kansas and they survived so it became a thing after that but this is absolutely the last thing you actually want to do and i'll tell you why so the first reason why you should never try to take shelter underneath an overpass is that you're exposed to higher wind speeds when you're up underneath in that tight space. Also, you're vulnerable to the blowing debris that could be getting tossed around from a nearby tornado or straight line winds. Okay, you have absolutely no shelter from either of those things. And then thirdly, your parked vehicle could start causing issues for traffic behind you because they're going to start slowing down. They're going to start causing a traffic jam. Also, people are going to say, well, they're parked there. I'm just going to park right here in the middle of the road. And then for you know it, that whole underpass is blocked and everyone can't get around to actually get to better safety down the road. So that's why it's super important never to consider overpasses. All right, so just like tornadoes and the frequencies of the different ones, here's a nice visual on the frequency of, of the hailstorms that we get here in North Texas. So over on the left, you'll see that about 30 days per year, we are going to see hailstorms that produce hail the size of pocket change. That's not too bad. You know, that size of hail of quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies, it'll sound loud on the windows, but that's typically not really gonna do any damage. You might see some, some more leaves on the ground than normal, but that's about it. Now, 15 to 20 days per year on average, we'll see hail the size of golf balls or half dollars. That is gonna make you wish you cleaned out your garage to get that car in. Um, uh, that will leave a few dings on the hood of your vehicle. And then four or five days a year, we might get hail the size of tennis balls or baseballs. That is definitely gonna make you wish you clean out your garage. 
uh, by now. Um, that will definitely put some cracks in, in your windshield um, if it's falling hard enough. If, if you're driving into the storm, that's definitely going to cause some issues too. So, And then maybe one day a year, like Hondo, Texas last year, we're going to get hail the size of softballs or bigger. Okay, the one uh, hailstones that fell in Hondo, Texas last April was over six inches long, six inches wide. Insanity. I actually gave a presentation there in November uh, in Hondo um, at a local school, talked to two groups there. And many of those kids, many of their families are still displaced from this storm from last April. So they, so the teachers and the kids had some really incredible stories to share with me about this. So again, this is a very one-off rare situation, but it can happen as we all know from Hondo, Texas last year. Comment if you're from that area. Let me know your story about that. I, I would love to see some personal encounters from that storm near San Antonio last April. All right, the last topic is floods. So remember that Fairview Town Hall, Town Center picture? This is a photo from that same day, same area. This is at the intersection of Stacy and 75 and Allen. Again, it looks like hail there on the embankment, <laughs> uh, or it looks like snow, but it's actually hail. And then it started to flood a lot because there was a lot happening all at once with that storm. So when we talk about floods here in Texas, unfortunately, as of a couple of years ago, in the last 10 years, there have actually been 225 lives lost due to people trying to drive in floods here in Texas. Um, that is something that can be approved upon. That's why you see that slogan flashing on highway signs that says, turn around, don't drown. It is absolutely not necessary to try to cross a flooded roadway, even if you can see the other side. Even if you think you can cross that real quick and get to the other side, you most likely won't. That water is rushing across that road for a reason. And that reason is because there is no more road. That, the, that, that force of the floodwaters washed it away. So if you were to try to drive across it, you're most likely not going to find the road. You're going to end up floating and washing downstream. So let's talk a little bit more about that. How much rushing water does it really take to start doing some damage? Well, it only takes six inches of fast moving water to take me and you off of our feet if we were to try to cross that same road. Six inches, that's not very much. That's maybe right above the ankle for a lot of us. So um, 12 inches of fast moving water is what it takes to wash away most small cars, small SUVs, ATVs, motorcycles. And then 18 to 24 inches is what it takes to wash away most of everything else on the road. Buses, semis, tractors, big lifted trucks, you are not immune to this. So um, again, turn around, don't drown. Over 50% of these fatalities that happen from driving in floodwaters was actually at night. Uh, you know, those floodwaters are hard to see. So, you know, just be aware, have some situational awareness of what the weather is doing around you at any given day or time, okay? And there's a lot going on on this, but I kind of already talked about already. The, on, on the left is another radar scope screen grab from storms that were just training they were it was just storm after storm after storm for about two or three days in the fall of 2018 some of y'all might remember that um, at, at, at the time i had a five-year-old in the house and that meme in the corner there if it's too small for you to see says for the love of god stop raining because if you're a parent to a small child like i am you understand the insanity that ensues when kids are locked inside for that long <laughs> with all that rain happening so there's actually two types of floods and you're probably like well a flood's a flood well it's the timing of it that makes the difference so flash floods are floods that happen in less than six hours those are the floods we experience here in North Texas the most because these floods are a result of a large amount of rain falling in a very short amount of time. And then regular floods are something that happen in about 6 to 8 to 10, 12 hours, maybe a day or so. Typical of living along like a river and, you know, the river cresting and such. We don't really see that much here in North Texas. We usually experience flash floods. So, again... Don't try to cross the flooded roadway. Please don't try to go through the barricades. Those are there to protect you and keep you safe. Just please try to find an alternate route around the floodwaters. Okay, that's it for all those topics. Let's have some key takeaways here to remember from each one. So with lightning, thunder roars, go indoors, 
you're already too close to the storm, you can hear the thunder, tornadoes, please rest assured that on average, 88% of the tornadoes that happen here in the U.S. on an annual basis are going to be EF0s to EF1s, which are the weakest of tornadoes. And then with hail, we want to treat severe thunderstorm warnings like we do tornado warnings. We want to get away from those windows. We want to put as many walls between us and the outside as possible and just wait it out. And then with floods, turn around, don't drown. Okay, I'm going to give you guys some tips and tidbits for this upcoming spring, especially if you're new to North Texas and you're like, well, shoot, you've given me all this information, but what can I do now after the fact? So number one, a very shameless plug here. We have a free app available on the Apple and Google stores, the Texas Storm Chasers app. This is kind of an all-inclusive place to go for severe weather. Um, it, for one, it has the interactive HD radar that you can watch storms on. You can also get notifications when David or Jenny put out their severe weather blogs ahead of any severe weather events that we might be anticipating. And then you can see when David goes live uh, for his broadcast. And last but not least, you can get a shortcut to our rapid updates on our Twitter feed. So if you, sub if you subscribe to our Twitter account, you'll be able to get those in real time. Secondly, I mentioned that Skywarn Storm Spotter training before. This is great for anyone who, you know, you might be a truck driver, you might be someone who's outdoors a lot. This gives you a very nice overview of just some situational awareness information. Um, just some ways to be able to kind of look at the sky, kind of gauge what's going on around you and make those decisions. So it's free. Um, the online training happens any time of the year. In fact, you can just Google online Skywarn spotter training and it'll take you to this MetEd website. And you can enroll, you can register, you can take the course, you get a nice little certificate of completion at the end. Uh, again, it, it's, it's free, it's you know, at your own pace online. If you are more of a in-person learner, each county, the county that you live in, most likely puts on this in-person training once a year, and it's happening now. They're typically scheduled between January, February, and March before severe weather season gets going. So Google search your county, Skywarn storm spotter training and it'll pull up a schedule and you can find out when and where your county is going to have theirs next if it hasn't happened already. Last but not least, have multiple ways of getting severe weather info. Please don't just solely rely on David and his live broadcast or Jason and Alex or anyone in the field who's out chasing these storms already. Please don't let that be the first time you hear about this weather. There are a ton of ways to get um, mobile alerts, either through apps or through text messages or emails. Um, the first tier you see on that graphic is, of course, our already in place um, wireless emergency alerts. Okay, when we get those amber alerts, that's the same system that some of those severe weather alerts come across as well. There's weather apps, you know, our local news stations have their own little wet weather app. And then, of course, the Texas Storm Chasers app. And then mobile.weather.gov has some helpful tidbits. Um, and then of course, family of friends. You know, uh, one safety tip is if, if you and your family are experiencing severe weather and you're separated, you know, say you've got some older kids who are at a game and you're at home and severe weather happens, have an out of town contact that you all can reach out to individually to let them know that you're okay in the event you can't reach out to your family. So just have a plan have a way to receive multiple alerts. And of course, this includes a weather radio. You know, you might think, well, those are outdated. No, those are the things that are gonna be working when there's no electricity, there's no Wi-Fi, no internet, none of that. And you can Google, or you can look on Amazon. Um, I suggest a Midland weather radio. You can buy those for 30, 40 bucks on Amazon or a store like Fry's Electronics or any sort of local electronic store that you might have. So if you don't have a weather radio, I highly suggest it because not only can you turn those on and listen to severe weather when there's no power, you can also charge your devices on those things. Um, mine's downstairs or else I'd bring it up, but uh, it has a port, a USB port that I can charge my devices. It also has a flashlight. Um, it also has a strobe light. So it has all these different things. And that one is a, a Red Cross one, I believe, so. All right, that's it. 
I will stop talking. I will start taking some questions now. This is my contact information. If you're watching this and you're thinking, wow, I could actually use this kind of custom content for a group, whether that be an HOA. Yes, I speak to homeowners associations across the Dallas Fort Worth area, um, talking to new residents about, you know, this stuff. And, um, you know, this presentation I just gave today is a very mini version of what I actually talk about in my paid presentations. I include our own chase content like videos and such when talking about these things. So it's definitely worth investing in that kind of information for your residents. Uh, also, if you have a lunch and learn and you would like a guest speaker, uh, this is the perfect time to get someone like me out, especially before severe weather gets going. And then if you're interested in following us, if you're not already, Instagram, Twitter, we're on TikTok, we're on Twitch, um, and then also there's our website. So. I will go ahead and start taking some questions. So I'm gonna come through the comments here. Um, <gasps> Tejal, hi! I actually just gave a presentation for her school earlier this year. So thank you for your comment. That means so much. <laughs> I hope you're doing better. All right, I'm gonna come back through and see if there's any comments. There's a lot of people watching, or there was. Zach, you remembered the hail that hit Wiley. Yes, I do too. Um, my son's dad has family in Wiley and the stories that they had, you know, they weren't hit just once, they were hit twice. Maribeth, where are the storms located? Um, in the description of this live, it mentioned that this is just a presentation on severe weather awareness. We are not live with any sort of severe weather events at the moment. Thank goodness. So to the 20 somewhat people still watching, thank you. Um, Clarissa had a good question. How come tornadoes don't have names like winter storms or hurricanes? Simply, there's, there's just too many of them. Uh, in the general public eye, no, there are no names. But if you talk to a storm chaser, if I, if I were to say, hey, Chapman, Kansas, or hey, Dodge City, Kansas, half the storm chaser community is going to know I'm talking about May of 2016. <laughs> So storm chasers name the tornadoes based on where they happen, and that's kind of how we keep track of them. Um, but Shelly, yeah, Wiley is way too familiar with hail. They actually, you know, beat that once a year. They, they got that hail twice that year. Uh, what, a month apart, I think? It wasn't very long. All right, I'm still looking at comments. Okay, this is your time to shine. This is your time to ask me questions. You know, this is your time to, to ask, to comment, to let me know. Um, if you have kiddos, I'm actually going to do this presentation on Sunday at 3.30 here on the Texas Storm Chasers Live. So if you have kiddos, I would say between first grade and on, this would be good for only because kinder, it might just be over their heads. And then the older kids might be a little bored. Uh, so I would say grade school, middle school is the sweet spot for the presentation I'll be giving on Sunday at 3.30 here on Facebook Live. Zach asks, what's your opinion on Radar Scope versus other apps? Hold on. I need to get that water in me. So I've only tried Radar Scope. Um, you know, as we get older, we kind of stick to things that we that are tried and true. We hate change. <laughs> so Radar Scope I've just stuck with because it's familiar and I know it. I love it for the different tiers that I can subscribe to for different times of the year. You know, I subscribe to tier two when it's chase season, I drop it down to one when it's not. Um, there is another app out there called Radar Omega, and that has been a very up and coming instrument in storm chasing as well. Have I tried it? No. I know people who have and they love it. So I personally, I'm just going to stick with Radar Scope because that's just what I know. and. I just don't have the mental capacity to try anything new at the moment. I know y'all know what I mean by that. Ugh. Like, when I upgrade my phone now. I'm 35 and I shouldn't already be griping about how much effort it takes to upgrade a phone. <laughs> anyway. Questions, comments. I'll be doing this again in February. I'm just not sure when yet. As we start going through these months, they are going to be scheduled maybe a week or two in advance simply because of tornado season upcoming. I don't want to schedule one of these and then there be a chase. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, it very well still could happen. Heck, I could probably just do this from the field. I'm sure you guys would love that. And then the same thing for kids. So I'm going to be doing 
two free presentations a month, one for adults and one for kids. I only redid this one today because of how awful um, the internet was last night. So I wanted to redo this, kind of give everybody else a chance. You know, this can be watchable after the live ends. So throughout the day, um, if you see this, you'll be able to, to rewatch it. So you're not missing out on much. So for those that are watching, let me know where you're tuning in from. I'll give you some helpful tidbits. Jose, do you know if we can expect power grid issues with extreme cold weather again? I would say expect it. I mean, what did we learn last year? I definitely don't want to get stuck in a rut like last year. Although I'm very grateful because my spouse um, is a regular at Windstar Casino and he had free room comps and we were actually able to leave our house, which barely had any electricity and go into Oklahoma and stay there for a couple of nights, just to kind of wait this out. So I would definitely expect it, but no, I don't know the ins and outs on whether or not we're more prepared for it than last year. I would say that's to each their own. You know, if you learned your lesson, you're going to be more prepared for it than last year. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I was here for that last year. That was my spouse who's from Chicago. He laughed at us for like three days straight in a lighthearted way. You know, in a, I can't believe you guys think this is cold. It was a low of negative two. Heck yeah, that's cold to us. <laughs> that's not okay. Comment if you're here, but you're from the north. Let me know that because that's always fun to interact with. For those of you who are just tuning in that are like, wait, what did I miss? I just did a quick live adult presentation on severe weather awareness. Um, I had one last night. It was my first one. The internet was absolutely garbage. So I thought, well, today while everyone's at work and not home, I'll attempt this again. So here I am attempting it. So I'll probably stay on for another couple of minutes. I want to catch any questions that people might have, any comments. Let me know where you're from. Where do you live? Well, that sounds very stalkerish. Where do you live? What county do you live? What? Whatever. That's fine. I'm just interested in seeing where everybody's from. It's pretty cool. Being from Oklahoma and living here, that's just cool to me. So questions on severe weather awareness? Questions on anything upcoming? Y'all know Baldy and Chief David is in uh, New Jersey. He flew out this morning to cover the uh, impending uh, snowstorm up there. So you guys probably saw his post from earlier. Rest of us are going to hang out here where it's warmer and just watch David from afar. Tejal, you spent five years in Kansas? <gasps> Joplin 2011. I mean, there is nothing that can get more devastating than that, I don't think. Um, that's pretty, that's, that's incredible that you have a story from, from that. So you know firsthand on what this weather's like. Tejal was one of my contacts for a presentation I did for school uh, just in the last, was that this, the, this month? <laughs> I, I'm telling you, this 2022 is already like flying by for me already. My cat is meowing to get in the door. The office upstairs is the warmest part of the house, so she's mad that the door is shut. Penny, Mount Enterprise, Russ County, awesome. You grew up in Ohio, all right. Yes, um, Ohio can see their fair share of severe weather, especially in the summer. The Midwest, their severe weather season is typically in the summer, kind of like the high plains. So yes, Penny, I'm sure you have stories to tell. Zach, did you chase the really bad tornado that went through Rockwall about five years ago? Are you referring to 2015, December 26th? If so, I was not on that particular tornado. I was on one that formed to the west. That was my first tornado, the one that was near Red Oak. That was my first tornado in the dark in December. Never would I have thought that my first tornado would have been the day after Christmas in the dark. That's pretty scary. <laughs> Yeah, Tejal, de December. Yes, that's when we had that presentation for the school. That's right. So, Zach, I appreciate your questions. Tejal, I appreciate your comments and engagement on here. Thank you very much. 
For those of y'all joining in, I just did, I just wrapped up a presentation for the adult crowd on severe weather awareness and storm chasing. So uh, once I end this, you can rewatch it if you wish, and then ask me any questions that you want to. Let's see. Okay. All right. We're still holding at 20 something people. So y'all are still interested in something. So let me know. Let me know of any questions you might have. Pretty much anything at this point. Oh, Zach, you were you there? <laughs> I can't even imagine. Like, uh, that was an insane storm. December 26, 2015 near Walkwall. That was that was wild. I was actually living in Oklahoma at the time when the May 3rd, 1999 happened near Moore. I was living in Shawnee, which is just, you know, northeast of, well, east of Moore and not very far. So I remember that day and night very vividly. You know, I, I was just a kid. I was seventh grade. And of course, you know, I was, I knew I was obsessed with weather at that point. But when that happened, that completely changed the trajectory for me. I was just like, heck yes, this is, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to learn more about. So after that, I had actually, oh, you know what? I have it right here. I always love to show this off. Y'all are going to laugh. Check out this binder that I made when I was a kid. So I took, I took newspaper articles and saved them. And then I also took calendar photos that I liked when I was a kid and kept them and put them in a binder. And then... I kept old newspaper articles. I actually kept a journal on what the weather was like. These entries are from August of 2000. I would listen to my NOAA weather radio clock and I would make these observations. This is November of 2001. So as you can see here, I was pretty obsessed. July of 2002, I mean, when did I stop? My last entry, my last entry was July 16th, 2002, Tuesday at 9 a.m. We were expecting some severe weather that day. And it's just crazy. I love being able to look back at this and be like, this is what I did as a kid. And then I kept all, all of this. These are all calendar pictures. And then another newspaper art article here. So encourage your kids to do something like this. I am so happy I kept this. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, let me look at some questions. Okay, Zach, you live on the other side of Lake Levon. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, that's... Mm -mm. That, that would have been a blood draining from my face moment for sure. Okay, the view count's dropping, so I'm assuming everybody's kind of done with this and there's no questions. So I appreciate everyone who stuck around for this. If you were here last night, thank you for sticking through that. I hope this one was a little bit better than last night. And I will be hosting the kids version of this presentation Sunday at 3.30 here on Facebook Live. So if you have kiddos, I do have an event that is posted um, in the events tab for Texas Storm Chasers. So <gasps> Terry! Oh my gosh, thank you for those stars. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Oh my gosh, you just made my day. Thank you. <laughs> for those of y'all who don't know what stars are, stars are is Facebook's way of allowing you to contribute to your favorite content creators on the platform. Um, it is a monetary contribution. Facebook usually loads your account with stars already that are free to, to give. Um, but after you use those up, it does cost you to reload with those stars and pass them out to your favorite content creators like Texas Storm Chasers. Stars help us be able to afford the things that keep Texas Storm Chasers running on a, on a monthly basis. We have our website that we pay for. We have our app that we pay for uh, either monthly or on an annual basis, which are both for free to the public. We don't charge the public for any information or use of those two things. So 
it's costing us money right off the bat to be able to provide Texas storm chasers like this. And STARS just help us allow to recoup for those finances lost because we're spending our own paychecks on keeping these types of things running. Um, and then we have um, all of our streaming and uh, subscriptions that it takes to have the software to be able to do the really cool things like we're doing right now virtually. You know, for us to, to do live streaming in the field, that, that's a monthly subscription to one, two, or several things to be able to set that up for you all. So STARS just help us recoup that, helps us put some money away to, to, to provide better uh, content and to provide better technology down the road. There are several things that we're looking at adding to help enhance the experience for you all. So those STARS are very helpful. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I was talking about the next time I'll be live will be Sunday at 3.30 Central Time uh, for the kiddos. So please go RSVP to that um, event so you can keep up with the updates there. It does say 3 o'clock. I know that. Um, I bumped it to 3.30 simply because we're going to be in Oklahoma this weekend and I want to give myself enough buffer zone you know, to get back, to get set up and to kick that off for, for the kiddos. So it'll be of a similar style. I'll talk about those four topics of severe weather for the kids and then stay tuned for February schedule for the severe weather awareness as well. And as always, if you want to bring me to your group, either virtually or in person, please email me. That's my email right there, chelsea at texasstormchasers.com. Again, it was fantastic speaking with everybody today. I really appreciate your attention and time here today. And I'm going to go ahead and end this live video. So thank you.